Happy Sabbath, happy Sabbath, happy Sabbath. Thank you for joining us. I would like to uh, welcome everybody uh, informally now. In the moment, we're going to begin the program fully. And uh, in the meantime, I'm going to ask you to please click that share button. And if you're watching on Facebook, click the watch study study feature. And that way more people can get closer to God through his word. And hopefully uh, this Friday evening will be the beginning of a new experience for some of us in Christ. I know that sometimes it gets very difficult to uh, maintain self-control, maintain a close connection with God, but he is going to share with us tonight through his word how we can have victory, have victory in word and in thought, in word and in thought. And I'm going to really get ahead of myself here if I don't pause. So please click the share button, click the share button, click the watch party feature. And uh, in the meantime, go ahead and type in the feed how good God has been to you. I know he has been good to you because he's been good to me. And uh, even though we go through trials and I am in the midst of a massive trial, although we go through the midst of uh, although we go through trials, we know that God is faithful he will not leave us to our own devices if we are willing to receive him into all of our circumstances, uh, to not um, uh, disregard him. And we know that he will be with us. So let's go ahead and uh, continue to click the share button. In about 20 seconds, we'll pray and get underway. Thank God for the privilege of being able to come together in this manner. Uh, the technology has advanced such that we can really, really connect with one another in a way that, boy, 20 years ago, it would have been very difficult to imagine. So thank God for this privilege. Let's go ahead and pray and get started. Father in heaven, thank you for giving us another Sabbath, giving us uh, your word and giving us your um, mercy, mercy, because victory is something that seems to be elusive and hard to come by. Because sometimes we turn our backs on you. Sometimes we hear good counsel and then disregard it. And so, Father, I'm asking you to begin our lives anew, that you will teach all of us who are watching and maybe some listening, teach us all to surrender ourselves in a way that maybe we have never be done before, and that this will be the last time we need to do so because we are fully resolved, fully committed, that until Jesus comes, we will be committed to you. But Father, I pray we never get proud, we never get um, weary in well-doing, but that we will trust you for every step until uh, the ceiling is finished and Jesus eventually returns. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen again. Well, I would like to welcome you to the NET 2018 and Beyond Bible Class. My name is L. David Harris. I am your host, and we have been studying the Bible together consistently every single week, save one week, one week we missed uh, since February 2018. And of course, uh, some who are joining us for the first time may be wondering why we keep talking about 2018. It was really just our starting point uh, when we had an online series, and this is really continuing in the legacy of that blessed event where God was really kind to us to do things that we hadn't yet done in the Central Jamaica Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. So I'd like to welcome you again. If you're watching on Facebook Live, welcome. If you are watching on YouTube Live, welcome. And if you are watching on NCU TV, welcome. And thank you for your time investment with us. This is uh, part number seven in our Victorious Life series or The Victorious Life. And our caption for tonight is Victory in Word and Thought. Victory in Word and Thought. Thought. And it's very interesting. Uh, one of uh, the persons I used to listen to many, many years ago when I was very young, uh, a preacher, he said something like this, and I need you to catch the nuance, okay? He used to say, you are not what you think you are, but what you think you are. Did you get the pause? I'll say it again. You are not what you think you are. 
This is the reality, right? Some of us have a perception of self. He's saying that that perception is not necessarily, and, and I put the word necessarily in air quotes, not necessarily the reality, but what will determine the reality? Well, what I'm thinking. I, what I'm, I am not what I perceive myself to be, but whatever my thoughts are dwelling on is what is indicating who I really am. The Bible says um, that our thoughts are key because really that's where life and death begins for us, right? Sin doesn't begin by action. No, sin begins in our mind. A determination to do God's will doesn't doesn't uh, manifest itself first in actions. No, it manifests itself in our thinking. So as a, as a person thinketh in our hearts, that's how and who we are. All right. And so that's something very interesting to consider as we talk about victory in word and thought. How many times have persons uh, made promises to you and come short of them? How many times? How many times, God forbid, have you made promises to people and come short of them? And so when I was young, a uh, fra uh, phrase was very important. Word is bond. Your word is your bond was was in vogue. And and it's true when we say stuff or say things, we need to what? Keep those things. If I say that I'm coming, I'm coming on at seven o'clock on Friday evening. Barring some tragedy or some technological problem that is unavoidable, I need to do what? Show up at this point, no matter what I'm doing. I need to keep my covenant with you, my, my, my promise to you. My word needs to be my bond. When we say, Lord, please forgive us for our particular sins, and Lord, please uh, help us to be victorious, and we will do X, Y, or Z, then we need to come through with those promises as well, right? And so God is very good to us, and that is our privilege. But again, the reality of that comes from the seat of our imagination, the seat of our intelligence, our thoughts, our thoughts. So we're going to begin uh, from the book of 2 Corinthians. That's the book of 2 Corinthians, and I will read chapter 10 and verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5, and then I'll give you the subheadings of our study tonight in a moment. Uh, the Bible says, casting down imaginations, of course we're breaking into a thought, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to obedience to Christ. We need to be subjecting ourselves, and this is not a bad way of saying it. We need to be subjecting all of our thoughts or passing all of our thoughts through the filter of Jesus Christ. And then every argument, every excuse, every thing that we set up that says, well, I can't be victorious. Well, I have tried so many times, so I give up now. Well, I am really tired of God not answering my prayers just as I pray them and in the manner that I pray them and at the time that I pray them, therefore, and then we continue with this sort of doubtful vitriol. No, all of those things are imaginations, every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and every thought must be in captivity to, and obedience to who? Jesus Christ, because Jesus gave all his life for us. He took on human flesh, the Bible says in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so we could become basically accepted in the beloved Jesus Christ, it says, so we could become the, uh, the adoption of sons, right? And so God is saying to us that because Jesus did all of this, and when he arose from the grave that one Sunday morning, he had victory in his hands, right? Victory in his wings. He had all the keys of hell, grave, death, and, of course, the power over temptation and sin for anyone who's willing to receive it. And therefore, it's, it, it only stands to reason. It is reasonable that we would serve God 
with all that we are and all that we have. And so we're going to continue our study here under a few subtopics. Self-control, that's a big one. Self-control, controlling the tongue, not judging or being judgmental. I would prefer that. Pardon me. I should have said that. Not being judgmental. And then the remnants mastery of the tongue. Now, that's very interesting. Let's come back to that in just a little while. Uh, we're doing pretty good on time now. Self-control. And so we're going to the book of Proverbs, and hopefully you are following in your Bibles, the book of Proverbs, chapter 16. That's the book of Proverbs, chapter 16, and I will read verse 32. Proverbs, chapter 16, and I will read in verse 32. And the Bible reads, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. So if you want to know how to be a great and mighty man or woman of God, if you want to know how to be uh, an effective soldier, if you want to know how to be powerful beyond your own natural capability, ask God to make you slow to anger. There are too many persons who are completely out of control. The least little thing causes them consternation and offense and they feel like they have to just give you a piece of their mind. And one person said, if you keep giving people a piece of your mind, how much will you have left or what will you have left? And so God has given us the privilege that we can actually be slow to anger, right? Slow to anger, better than the mighty. And he that ruleth his spirit, that he, then he that taketh a city. And I can think of one man historically, like a, a legend, really. Uh, his name was Cyrus. I don't know if you remember him, but the Bible called him a uh, shepherd. Bible gave him sort of a, uh, uh, an imagery of being like Christ in terms of uh, overtaking uh, that evil Babylon that had set itself up against God and made it seem as if it was impregnable against all attacks and you know, it was just an affront to God, really, Babylon was. And the Bible says that Cyrus, who came from one of the two nations that were supposedly less powerful than Babylon, they overthrew Babylon through an ingenious plan that Cyrus had. And God used all of that as a symbol of Jesus Christ overcoming the Babylonish mindset in all people who are willing to be saved. To the Hebrew mindset, Babylon means confusion, and I agree. To the Babylonian mindset, Babylon means the gate unto the gods. So when the Tower of Babel was erected, they were trying to do what? They were trying to find a path into the safe place where God is, except they were doing it not according to his will. And so when it says here, uh, then that he who ruleth his spirit, then he that taketh us is, is more mighty, basically, than he who takes a city. Think of the best case scenario. And I used Cyrus as, in my mind, the best case scenario. The Bible is saying that if you can just control your anger, if you can just rule your spirit, not somebody else's, not you know, leave a legacy of this behind for others to model. If you can just rule your own spirit, when somebody cuss you on the road or bad mind you and bad drive you, if you can just keep yourself under self under control, when your coworkers seem to have lost their minds, if you can keep yourself under control and rule your spirit, the Bible says that what you are like or more powerful than a person like Cyrus who clearly did what no other person could have done. They over, he overtook uh, Babylon, the mighty Babylon, the great Babylon. So do you want to have an achievement on your resume, your spiritual resume? Just be under the control of the Holy Spirit. Self-control is actually one of the tentacles uh, of the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And then, of course, come the outgrowths of love, one of which is self-control. Well, what is, what is one able to do who is in control of his or her words? So we talked about the, the gross or general self-control, 
the general control of one's spirit, one's own spirit. But now we're going to talk about what if I can control my words. Let's see. From the book of James, chapter 3 and verse 2, the book of James, chapter 3 and verse 2, the Bible reads, For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. So a couple of things here. <laughs> the Bible is saying that if you can control your mouth, the things that you say, the manner in which you say it, it is evident that you are being perfected by God. And it's evident that you can also control your body. If you can control your mouth, you're being perfected by God. And you are also what? Able to be in control of your whole body. Well, it gives an example here of why you would say that in verse three, behold, uh, we put bits in horses mouths and that they may obey us. And we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, though they be so great or big and driven of a fierce wind, yet they are turned about with a very small helm whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so, the tongue is a little member, a tiny little thing con con in uh, comparison or in reference to the entire body. Even still, the Bible says here, and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And then, of course, it continues. And the tongue is a fire and a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, meaning all of our body parts, that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. So if we can control our mouths, surrender our will to God, so we speak only those things that edify, we speak only those things that that, that get us closer to God and whoever is listening also somehow get closer to God. I'm not saying that we have to say his name in every sentence. I'm just saying there are things that we ought not to ever say. There are doubts that we should never utter, should never be uh, going along the air airwaves. And God is saying, if you can control your mouth, you can control anything. And I'm going to read from the book, Christ's Object Lessons, page 335, the book Christ's Object Lessons, the uh, page 335, and it reads, the power of speech is a talent that should be diligently cultivated. Diligently cultivated. That means we need to, when we speak, we need to learn how to speak well. I'm not trying to tell you in what language or what dialect to speak. What I'm saying is that when we do speak, it needs to be clear. It needs to be distinct. It needs to be pleasant to the ears. If our voices work well, then we need to cultivate that uh, power, that ability, so that persons, when they hear our voices, won't be offended to listen. There are too many times that preachers like myself, too many times preachers get up in the pulpit and speak in a way that is offensive to the ear, that is even unnatural to the point that the vocal cords are being destroyed. And that's another discussion, but we have been given very clear counsel on this. And God is saying that even if you're passionate, like I get sometimes, like you, many of you may get sometimes, you have to cultivate speech and also take care of this vital uh, element called the vocal cords. Continuing, of all the gifts we have received from God, none is capable of being a greater blessing than this. What? Speech. Okay. With the voice, we convince and persuade. With it, we offer prayer and praise to God. And with it, we tell others of the Redeemer's love. How important, then, that it be so trained as to be most effective for good.
And again, that's from the book, Christ's Object Lessons, page 335. Can you imagine that certain uh, things we say are coming from the same mouth where we praise God? Hmm. And those certain things are uncomely. They are unsanctified. They are full of complaints and gossip sometimes. Sometimes, and I know a few people who, are, who, are, are, who have a habit of doing this, running around talking behind people's backs, impugning their character, disrespecting them, right? Firing shots around the corner and saying all sorts of things against people. And, and uh, the writer here is saying that we need to train all of that constitution there to be effective for good and not for evil. All right, let's continue. We're going to read from the book of Matthew. What book did I say? If you were in public, you would tell me. Matthew, Matthew chapter 12, and uh, I will begin reading at verse 34. The book of Matthew chapter 12, and I will begin reading at verse 34. And the Bible reads, O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? So this is showing us that, again, that uh, um, we are not what we think we are, but what we think we are. So our thought life is really what shows us what we are. And the Bible also says that, that by their fruits, we shall know them. And not just them, we shall be known by our fruits. And so if we are manifesting an evil fruit, then that shows that that is our real character, right? We can't have uh, uh, a mango tree bearing uh, green grapes because it's against nature. And therefore, we should not be confused or deceived when we see behaviors that are of a certain um, type that is not toward God because Sometimes people want to sort of uh, deceive us into believing that they are of God while they are showing ungodly characteristics on a consistent basis, including what they say. And so we need to believe what we see, understand and discern the fruit and, you know, move accordingly. And so the Bible reads here at ver beginning at verse 34 of Matthew chapter 12, O generation of vipers. This is Jesus speaking. How can ye being evil speak good things? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And so sometimes we may be having a conversation and somebody will bust a bad word, just drop a bad word and say, oops, I'm so sorry. And maybe the person is apologetic. Fine. I don't know where that came from. Well, now, now, now we're being disingenuous here, right? It came from the abundance of the heart. The only way that I'm able to sort of Talk those things, no matter what the circumstance, whether it's my anger, whether it's my fear, whether it is surprise, you buck your toe and then bum, drop an expletive. Well, that's because it's, it's, it's part of the abundance of the heart, right? When people uh, speak consistent, good, uh, good things to persons. I have a friend named, um, well, I won't say who, but I have a friend, two friends, actually, I can think of in Trenchtown, who whenever you speak to them, you, you ask them how they're doing. And the praise that comes out of their mouths every single time you ask these couple of persons that I'm talking about how they are doing, even though they are going through trials and tribulations and would rather things be going a different way in their lives, their mouths are full of praise consistently for years. I have seen this with the two that I have on my mind. And so it's because that is the abundance of their heart. It just leaks out. They can't help it. It overflows out of the abundance of their heart. Verse 35, a good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. Well, that makes perfect sense. But I say unto you, verse 36, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of of judgment. Oh my. Verse 37, for by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Let that settle in. Lord, help us all. And so he's not saying simply to control our words because, again, 
Words are simply a manifestation or maybe even symptomatic, depending on what level we're talking about here, symptomatic of the reality of our heart condition, right? So if someone is coughing and sneezing uncontrollably, you don't immediately assume what is wrong with that person and give them some kind of remedy without knowing what the reason is, right? There are certain medications that are not sold in Jamaica because they know that over-the-counter, I'm saying, without a prescription, because they know that people will self-diagnose inaccurately, and then, as a function of this inaccurate self-diagnosis, go and find some medication to so-called treat something they think it is, and then, ultimately, it's something far worse, and that medication that they have unadvisedly chosen will have only made it worse because delay to treatment has taken place. And so we're not chasing symptoms. We're not looking at things outwardly and saying, okay, this is it. No, we go to the root. And when we get to the root, we get to the level of the heart. Then it will resolve the mouth problem. The mouth is only symptomatic of or a manifestation of what is in what? The heart. Amen. Okay. I'm going to read uh, from the book Christ's Object Lessons again. It's a really good book on this subject. Uh, Page 337, okay? And it reads, not one word is to be spoken unadvisedly. There goes that word again. No evil speaking, no frivolous talk, no fretful repining or impure suggestion. There are some things people say, boy, before I was saved or... Boy, before I was baptized, you know what I would have done to him? You know what I would have done to her? You see what's happening now? We are poisoning the air and the atmosphere if we behave in that way, speak in that way. We're poisoning the atmosphere with the same sort of sinful miasma as if we had already actually uh, performed the evil thing that we keep bringing back up. If I had done... Because we're really just saying that we want to do it now, but for some reason we are restraining ourselves. But it's in our hearts and our desires to do those bad things that we, quote, used to do. But we're not to be fretful and, and in, our, in, our, in our thinking and talking because there are some people who will not recover uh, from what we have said. Sometimes we are um, um, so discouraged that we speak discouraging words, and maybe we could recover. But what if the persons who are listening to us don't recover or can't recover? What have we done in that case? Have we been a good influence or not a good influence? And I think we know the answer. The Apostle Paul, writing by the Holy Spirit, says, let no corrupt communication. He didn't say, say, let only a little bit of. He said, let no corrupt. Corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. A corrupt communication does not mean only words that are vile. Some of us don't say bad words. I can tell you, I'm one of them. I don't say bad words. It's not in me to say bad words anymore. Uh, 30 years ago, I would have said all kind of bad words, right? But now, no bad words, right? So I'm off the hook, right? That means I'm holy, right? Well, wait a minute. It means any expression contrary to holy principles and pure and undefiled religion. So for those who have a habit of running around lying on people, uh, that means that we are not doing what God says to. For those who run around and tell the truth, I'm only telling the truth. I'm only saying what is true about this person, but it is unbecoming. That means you're a gossip, God forbid or a gossiper, in that case, it is unholy, even if no bad words are mixed in. And I said, I read, you know, I read about something uh, this week here, pardon me, where somebody was low-key casting shade, or for those who don't understand the colloquialism, casting aspersion on someone behind their back and saying, boy, this and this and this and this positive thing, I see this positive thing is happening. I am so... um, I am so amazed that this positive thing could happen because after all, and then starts to run down the person and talk about how bad they were 
in these certain ways in the past. And boy, I can't imagine how they could possibly be doing this wonderful, positive thing. And I'm thinking, what in the world? I heard this uh, from a third party. It wasn't me interacting with them because if I were, I would have really checked it in Jesus' name because we have to call sin by its right name. We cannot run down people and then say that we're holy. We can't run down people and say that we are children of the king because Jesus would not do that. It means, again, by any expression contrary to holy principles and pure and undefiled religion. It includes impure hints that and covert insinuations of evil. Unless instantly resisted, these lead to great sin. Oh, my. Now, Jesus it was warning us, according to Desire of Ages, page 323, warning in regard to the sin against the Holy Spirit is a warning against idle and evil words. Lord, help us all. Let our words always be uh, with grace so that persons can be encouraged when we speak and not discouraged. Let's continue from um, um, Philippians chapter 4. And verse 8, the book of Philippians chapter 4, and I will read verse 8. And this is a really good rule of thumb considering even our entertainment, because oftentimes what we put into our minds through entertainment, whether it be television or Internet or streaming or or reading or whatever it is, music, choices or even the things that we uh, go to some people like comedy clubs and some of those comedy um, programs or whatever are vile really and we make a habit of you know laughing in those cases and then wonder why we are uh, displaying a tarnished character because sometimes we take take life too lightly and then we begin to eat and drink those things that lead us away from God and then it's in a merriment uh, 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 scenario where we are really uh, having sport in it, enjoying ourselves to the point of laughing very passionately. Well, the Bible says here in verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just. And let me just say, just and justice in the scriptures, almost without exception, in both Old and New Testaments, means righteousness. So whatever's righteous, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, not evil report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Why? Because you are not what you think you are, but what you think you are. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And of course, we live and behave. And so the Bible says, if there be any virtue, well, what is virtue? A particular moral excellence as modesty and purity. So if there's anything like that, think on these things. And I say that to that, amen. So if you use that filter as a measuring rod for the things that you enjoy in entertainment, it will change your life forever. Amen. So we're also going to now talk about, we've already talked about self-control a little bit. We're going to also talk about controlling the tongue just a little bit further, controlling the tongue. I know we have touched the subject, but we're going to continue here in uh, Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 21. That's the book of Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 21. Continuing the thought we had a little bit earlier, uh, the wise man says again, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. We should not take lightly the things we say. There are some of you who are in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, or even beyond who are still suffering beneath the load of something that your parents said to you. I don't want to give any examples. I was really, really struggling just in this moment to give some examples. But I think you understand because I do not want to replay this in your mind. I do not want what we're doing here to be a trigger. I have to be conscious of what I say even. 
So I don't need to give you examples of how uh, maybe persons in authority may have uh, said things to you that had discouraged you and also caused you to be on the wrong track. And some people have even labeled you based on a uh, certain sin habit you may have had in the past or maybe something that happened to you. They caused that to become your moniker. You had nothing to do with it. Someone took advantage of you in a certain way. And then you started to live a life manifest by that trauma and drama for that matter. And now somebody labeled you by the activity that you took up based on what the abuse that came your way. This is unholy. And then when we do that, we really scar the psyche, scar the potential of persons who are under our influence. So again, Power of death and life is in the tongue. And in fact, when I was young, I remember a cousin of mine um, being involved in a situation that was so evil, quite frankly. I'm talking uh, more than 30 years ago, probably 32, 33 years ago. I can remember um, he was a gangster. And I remember um, somebody somebody um, uh, putting out uh, like a murderous plot against someone else. And he was involved with this, right? And then they tried to pull it back and say, oops, we made a mistake. Let's not get involved in this kind of thing. And the boy, the, the things that came down on his life, because when you, when you are going to do something like this, you are actually putting out into the atmosphere and into the ears of persons who are not about in, any good saying things that would cause the death of someone else and then try to pull it back. Well, it was very difficult to pull that back. Why? Because at the time, those guys didn't go for that. If you say and you say something and give a command to do this evil thing to someone, that's what it is. And you cannot pull it back. And so in sometimes it's quite literally the power of life and death is in the tongue. And we need to be cognizant of that. Uh, Psalm chapter 34, the book of Psalms, chapter 34 and verse 13. Psalms chapter 34 and verse 13. I learned a lot from that experience as a young, young man. And the Bible reads, keep thy tongue from evil. Look at that. Lying is evil. Gossiping is evil. Saying bad things about people is evil. Flattering people and not meaning it is evil. You understand saying things so that maybe you can get some reciprocal benefit that you did not mean is evil and the lips from speaking guile. Well, what does guile mean? Let's define guile. And uh, it means sly or cunning intelligence. You may recall the Bible says that the serpent in Eden, the serpent was more subtle than any beast which the Lord God had made, right? And so his subtlety and guile and uh, slyness, we would call him a dinal today or a scammer, right? And worse, really, he was the, the, the antagonistic force that drove Eve into a sinful situation, and so the Bible is saying that we need to refrain our mouths from speaking sly, cunning, uh, evil things as well. All right. Well, how is the difficulty of controlling the tongue illustrated back in the book of James? We're going to go back to the book of James. I know we were there a little bit earlier, but we're going to continue in the thought. Uh, that's the book of James chapter three, and I will read verses seven and eight. Again, for every kind of beasts and of birds and of serpents and things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of humankind. So we see in circus acts people controlling what elephants and predators like lions and leopards and all kinds of um, primates that really at one swipe of the hand, one errant swipe of the hand or intelli intel uh, um, intentional Swipe of the hand at the head, bomb might might near knock your head off. I've I've seen where a chimpanzee ripped a woman's face off. How do you do that? Well, these beasts are very powerful, but the Bible is saying that you have found a way to domesticate and or 
put these animals in captivity and control them in some ways, right? But, verse 8, can you imagine? But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. That sounds like a snake. And unfortunately, there are some people who behave like snakes. I remember one church sister I used to pray with, at, we used to pray at work a lot, and she would say, uh, that person's a snake in the grass. A snake in the grass. Wow. Well, there is poison, deadly poison in the mouths of some snakes. And so the Bible is telling us here, yes, you can control certain animals. Yes, even some of the, the most wild beasts in the field that the Lord God had made, even those you can bring into captivity and even domesticate some, but you can't control the tongue yourself. And that's where, again, the fruit of the Spirit comes in, because only the Holy Spirit can give us his fruit, which will have an outgrowth of self-control. So we must surrender to God so that he can be in control of all of our lives, our minds, so that whatever we say will always be sprinkled with grace. Okay, we're going to uh, the concept of not being judgmental. And I don't want to say not judging. I want to be careful not to say don't judge because, because there are so many places in Scripture where God teaches us that we should judge. But that's not the same. Like judging is discerning good from evil. Judging is saying, make a decision one way or the other, and that decision is along the lines of Christ, right? Uh, judging is, is seeing, like seeing the fruit and knowing or judging or discerning of what manner the, fr- the tree is or the root is, okay? Well, well, but God is saying, don't be judgmental. And basically, let's use a, a sort of a working definition here, uh, Uh, judgmentalism is for me as a human being who, like you, was born in sin, shapen in iniquity. And David said that we come forth from our mother's wombs speaking lies. So I and we, too, are the same. Neither one of us better than the other one. Both of us have all kinds of things working against us. Yes. And so what the Bible is teaching us is that judgmentalism is to say, I am holy, you are not. And, oh, my word, clutching pearls, of course, this is an example, right? Like an, uh, uh, a saying, clutching my pearl. Like, how in the world would have you done this? Oh, my. Look up that uh, idiom called clutching pearls. You understand what I mean. Making it seem like you are so appalled and confused. And how could somebody do fill in the blank sin when we ourselves are also doing other things that are unholy. And of course, Jesus said that you are trying to behold the little dust particle, the the little grain of sand that is in the eye of someone else while you have a two by four, a two by four coming out of your eye, blocking your vision. How hypocritical that is if we are like that. And so, That is not so judgmentalism is that and then saying and then saying the person is going to hell full stop. So condemning someone all the while trying to make ourselves better than they are. That is judgmentalism in a nutshell. So from the book of Matthew, chapter seven, the book of Matthew, chapter seven. And let me just say that God wants us to. Uh, know that if we are judging, we'll read this in a moment, we're going to be judged according to the same standard that we are judging. Okay, judge not that ye be not judged, verse 1, Matthew chapter 7. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Oh, wait a minute. Let me read it from uh, the Christian Standard Bible, do not judge so that you won't be judged, for you will be judged by the same standard. Okay, we're starting to get it clearer here. With which you judge others, and you will be measured by the same measure you use. Why do you look at the splinter in your brother's eye? You know how tiny that is? But Don't notice the beam of wood in your own eye 
Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the splinter out of your eye and look, there is a beam of wood in your own eye. Hypocrite, the Bible says. First, take the beam of wood out of your eye, and then you will see clearly to take the splinter out of your brother's eye. Did you note that last part of the text? So sometimes people say, because you may have skeletons in your closet or because you have sin and come short of the glory of God, that you cannot offer any guidance on anything that has to do with holiness. No, the Bible is saying don't be a hypocrite. Don't be living an overt sinful life or, or, or live in a habit of doing what you know is not right, what is not holy and just and good. And then all of a sudden you are becoming sort of the purveyor of truth and the judge of other person's characters. No, he's saying that if you will just surrender your own will to God, then you can be able to see clearly when you are trying to be helpful to someone. Okay. We're going to read also from the book of Romans chapter two in our just under 10 minutes left Romans chapter two. And I will begin reading at verse one Romans chapter two. And I will begin reading at verse one. Therefore, every one of you who judges is without excuse for when you judge another, you condemn yourself. Since you, the judge, do the same things. I think that is self-explanatory. That's self-explanatory. Who shall abide in the tabernacle of God? Because really and truly, our desire, our hope, our prayer is that we can dwell together with God. I think uh, the psalmist said that he would delight to be in the house of the Lord forever. And of course, that should be our desire as well. Our prayer is that we can be present with God forever and ever. He said he's going to prepare a place for us. And if he goes to prepare a place for us, he will also come again and receive us unto himself. That where he is, that's where we can be. Well, let's see if we can get a foretaste of that in the book of Psalms, chapter 15, verses 1 through 3. We're winding up. We're winding up. Uh, the Bible reads, beginning at verse 1, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. Oh, wait a minute. The truth has to be in my heart before it can come out of my mouth. Okay. He that backbiteth not his tongue, with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. And so the kind of people who will abide in the presence of God are basically those who have put on Christ, who don't make provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Those who put on Christ, who are called by his name, those persons will what? Tabernacle with God forever and ever. The tabernacle, the Bible says, of God will be with humanity. He will be with his people and we shall be, he shall be our God. Now, Paul actually uh, gives a commendation to graceful speech. A couple, a few really, but I'm going to read just one from the book of Ephesians. That's the book of Ephesians chapter four, and I will read verse 29. Ephesians chapter four, and I will read Read verse 29. Let no corrupt communication, how much? No corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. Is what you're saying or about to say going to be a minister of power, of victory, of deliverance, of encouragement, of kindness, and all other holy attributes to those who hear you. That's something that we have to determine and be honest with God. And if the answer is no, then we should not speak those things. And then eventually, if we surrender our will to God, he will create new thoughts in our mind so that whatever comes out will be exactly as the scripture says, that it will be full of grace to those who listen. 
the remnants mastery of the tongue. And these are the people of God in the last days without going into a revelation seminar, the people of God in the last days who believe in the fullness of the scriptures are the remnant. And we are actually uh, descendants, if you want to say, of the early church, many of whom were uh, uh, persecuted, so many of whom lost their lives over a 1,260-year period. So many stalwarts and holy people who came before us gave their lives. They loved not their lives, even to the point of death. So the remnant are cut from that same mold or cast in that same mold or cut from that same cloth. And so the remnant, especially, we're living in the last days, we are to have victory over our mouths, and by extension, our two little thumbs as, as we uh, seek to type in social media platforms. But that's another discussion. I will read uh, beginning at verse, thir- or read verse 13 of Zephaniah chapter 3. Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 13. There was another remnant here that's being referenced. The remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity nor speak lies. Neither shall a deceit have a, de- a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth, for they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Amen and amen again. That's self-explanatory. Let's read one more verse before we, uh, or one more passage, and uh, then I'll let you go. From the book of Psalms, the book of Psalms, chapter 19. That's the book of Psalms, chapter 19. And I will read verse 14. And the Bible reads, let the words of my mouth, this is your prayer, maybe your benediction upon your life, and the meditation of my heart, we say this flippantly sometimes, be acceptable in thy sight. Whose sight? O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And the people said, amen and amen again. So we have learned a little bit about the remnant's mastery over the tongue. Even in the last days, we need to be in control of our tongues, not being judgmental, controlling our tongues and having self-control overall, having generic self-control over our lives. And then we will see the fruit of God's uh, um, power being manifest for all to see. And I'm so thankful that God has shown us that we can have victory in word and in thought. And as you recall, Philippians 4, chapter 4, excuse me, verse 8, is a perfect, in my mind, rule of thumb for how we should govern our thought life and our entertainment. All right, let's go ahead and pray, and I will let you go. Father in heaven, thank you for giving us another Sabbath, for giving us the privilege of making it. And now I'm asking you uh, to fill us with your Holy Spirit. There is so much I know that you want to do in our lives. And I'm just asking you to do it in Jesus' name. Live your life inside our lives so that we can uh, glorify you in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And amen again. Well, I'd like to thank you for coming again to our uh, Bible class, which is held here every single Friday night by God's grace. And I would like to also invite you to our morning um, lesson study uh, related to the Sabbath school lesson for just 10 minutes every single day. That's seven days a week, 365 days a year. We are here by God's grace and studying the lesson study, giving uh, just a few ideas of what God may be saying to us. So your daily portion on the Central Jamaica Conference of Seventh-day Adventists Facebook page. And uh, we'd love to see you there. Have a wonderful rest of your night until we meet again in the morning. Lord sparing life, peace and love.